This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme. Okay, members, we have a quorum. Can I call the meeting to order? I declare the meeting open to the public uh, online. And can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Uh, we have no apologies in today. We have a full attendance. And in terms of chairperson's business, the only thing to report is that I attended um, on Tuesday at South Throne Hospital with the minute silence. I have to say, a very poignant event with a, a large range of of staff from health and social care, and uh, I think it was quite sobering to see the range of people who are out there on the front line on a daily basis. And the minute silence was in as a tribute to any all workers who have lost their lives through injury in in work, and that this year in particular we we would think about people who have lost their lives in relation to coronavirus in the in the course of their work. Uh, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on 23rd of April, which are tab 3.1 of your meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Yeah. Content, yeah. Uh, matters arising then, can I advise members that there are no matters arising? So we move now to this morning's first briefing, which is a COVID-19 disease response briefing from Business Services Organisation. I advise members that officials from the business BSO are joining us by telephone conferencing to discuss the procurement issues during the pandemic, including procurement and distribution of PPE and ventilators. So I'd now, now like to welcome Mr. Liam McIver, Chief Executive. Are you there, Liam? I am, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Sam Wade, Director of Operations. Sam, are you with us? Yes, Chair. And Mr. Peter Wilson, Assistant Director of Procurement and Logistics. Are you hearing us okay, Peter? I am indeed, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, you're quite faint, Peter, so if you could just try to stay closer to the phone. Yeah. I shuffled up. Good stuff, thank you. Okay, I would now go ahead then and I'll just invite the officials from BSO to go ahead and brief the meeting, please. Okay, thank you very much. And we appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, in order to set the scene, business service organisation procures and distributes goods and services on behalf of the whole health and social care family of organisation as an arm's length body department of health. Um, the business unit within BSO which is responsible for this is the procurement logistics service and the goods and services are varied and exceed £800 million pounds expenditure per year. We operate from four warehouses located in Belfast, Lisburn and Camp with two in Campsie. And in a normal business year, these warehouses would turn over in the region of 55 million per annum and supply the commonly used goods to all or HSC organisations. The warehouse goods are supplied to trusts mainly through electronic materials management inventory systems, which operate in every ward, theatre, emergency department, and intensive care unit in Northern Ireland. BSO, importantly, does not routinely supply product to independent health or social care providers, dentists, community pharmacists, or optometrists, and supplies only a limited range of medical devices to GP practices. Any goods not contained in BSO's warehouses are ordered by an online catalogue containing about 150,000 different purchase lines, all of which have been subject to competitive tender to secure best price. That is, in essence, chair business as usual position for BSO. In terms of preparing for a pandemic, planning for a pandemic rests with the Department of Health Policy Branch, and BSO has a service level agreement with the Department of Health Emergency Planning Branch regarding storage and housekeeping of products held to respond to a pandemic. Northern Ireland has been part of the UK Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Programme, commonly known as PIP, since around 2005-06. The UK Pandemic Flu Strategy was developed jointly and collaboratively by the four, four nations health departments, and underpinning this strategy is the concept of four nations working across the UK. Whilst departmental policy leads work closely with our policy counterparts in Scotland, England and Wales, BSO PALS works closely with the procurement leads from those countries in the same area. Northern Ireland has been, has been a beneficiary of joint pandemic influenza preparedness programme procurements, uh, which were used to build our current PIP stockpiles, and these are now being used to support business as usual due to global supply issues, so we're supplementing our normal routes with these. Northern Ireland is also the beneficiary of the UK PIP just-in-time procurements, which have been activated to provide and procure additional supplies of medical goods during COVID-19 response. 
some of these have arrived in Ireland already, and the benefit of this four-nation working has been better buying power and economies of scale for us in Northern Ireland, given the smaller scale of spend that we have. As we are only paying a Barnet share of the cost of these procurements, we save money, and the procurement resource is met by DHSC and Public Health England on our behalf. We've also Maybe been a beneficiary. A little there. Can you... Right, sorry. Yep. We've also been the beneficiary of UK mutual aid between the four countries during this pandemic, which is a key principle of joint working. If we look specifically at ventilators, BSO procure ventilators on, the, on behalf of Department of Health and Health and Social Care Board's Critical Care Network, NI, which is CANI. Uh, the need for the ventilators is coordinated by CANI in collaboration with the Health Care Board and Department of Health, who have developed their requirements based on projected need. They then engage with BSO PALS to procure ventilators and associated equipment which is needed to run them. BSO PALS access to available collaborative national procurement arrangements to source these ventilators, and where such routes were not available, the provisions contained within the public contract regulations 2015 were used. Since February 2020, we have sourced and procured 146 ventilators through local and national supply routes. There are further 494 ventilators on order. Um, dialogue with the Republic of Ireland has continued throughout COVID-19, including collaboration in sourcing ventilators. However, to date, the Republic of Ireland have not been able to share any deliveries of ventilators. Given the, the global supply chain pressures, we continue to work with CANI, Department of Health and UK national teams to ensure an adequate supply of ventilators is available. If we turn now to personal protective equipment, PPE, the key products set in the PHE guidance, Public Health England guidance, are uh, FFP3 masks, fluid repellent gowns, type 2R fluid resistant masks, aprons, gloves, and eye protection, which is typically visors or masks. In terms of storage and supply of PPE, before COVID-19, stocks of PPL were held by BSO. Sorry, stocks of PPE were held by BSO to support business as usual activity only, where demand for such products might be occasionally required to support normal working. That would be things like gloves, but also use of FFP3 respirators was fairly limited because it was for aerosol generating procedures. For an example, would be where a patient would have tuberculosis. Uh, in case of emergencies, trusts hold a small stockpile sufficient for seven to ten days, whilst the main emergency preferred stockpile is held by the Department of Health, which we know is the PIP stockpile. Since COVID-19 pandemic, BSO has undertaken a role to manage the supply of PPE to trusts, incorporating significantly increased demands into normal supply arrangements. Uh, this has required a high degree of collaboration with trust and Department of Health colleagues to support continuous supply. We have in order to do this effectively, we have introduced a push system of supply which ensures a more equitable distribution of products across, across trusts and enables the trust to control how and where stocks of PPE are deployed within their trust boundaries, recognizing that not all areas have the same requirements for PPE. BSO procures and distributes the PPE items to central points within each of the six HSC trusts for use by the trust and importing also by independent sector and social care providers who are provided with the PPE by trusts. You may have seen some examples of this in the Channel 4 programme last night. Trust supply teams subsequently release the PPE items to staff based on need, infection prevention control advice and Public Health England guidance. The trust supply PPE to independent sector providers using a number of different approaches and BSO supplies PPE direct to GPs community pharmacists, emergency dental centres and optometrists. Um, we have sourced and supplied items based on surge assumptions modelled for PPE and provided to us by the Health and Social Care Board. And for example, in the seven days ending the 24th of April, BSO supplied 12.6 million items of PPE to trusts and GPs this compares with a typical weekly issue of such items in 2019 of 1.45 million. So to restress those numbers, 12.6 million items 24th of April, 1.45 million normally. And in total, since the 1st of March 2020, 
we have issued in excess of 60 million items of PPE for use throughout health and social care and in the independent and community sector. In terms of requests for PPE, the surge modelling and the guidance has driven demand, particularly in the community, where demand has increased significantly since the launch of revised guidance by Public Health England on the 3rd of April. This has greatly increased the requirement on us. Um, there are clear global difficulties in the PPE supply chain, and we have received multiple requests for PPE, including from GPs, dentists, and others. Uh, these difficulties have meant that we've had to adapt our procuring and supply of PPE to the entire health and social care economy in Northern Ireland, either through direct supply to trusts and GPs or indirect supply to the independent sector. And that has been done through the trusts. Now, this has inevitably proved challenging, both in logistics of supply as well as in procuring the substantially increased volumes this represents. But I feel that BSO and the trust in particular have risen to this challenge, and there is now a steady stream of PPE getting into both trust and the uh, independent sector. If we look at procurement, um, in order to secure supplier product, we have made use of emergency provisions within existing <coughs> public procurement regulations to act quickly. But we've done this while maintaining diligence on product data assessments and risk assessment by clinical experts namely infection prevention and control nurses network and expert technical advice from the Medicines Optimization Innovation Centre, MOIC. Normal supplier checks continue to be applied with negotiation on price and terms being carried out as part of the procurement process. However, we recognise, and I think everyone recognises, that at present the PPE is a seller's market is a seller's market and demand outstrips supply, but we have to continue to maintain due diligence. In terms of securing PPE, we have adopted a three-pronged approach. The first one is locally led, and we have logged 1,229 offers of PPE from 400 different suppliers covering either manufacturing or supplier product. Through an established process, companies whose products have achieved acceptable levels of quality, safety, and risk assessment are then considered for ordering. A due diligence process is followed on suppliers in an effort to establish bona fides before final orders are placed, and you will be aware of some issues with scams and um, uh, uh, sort of corrupt practice in this area. Many of the companies offering supply are locally based, and some are offering to repurpose production to make products specifically for HSC. And there are examples where we have placed those contracts with, with suppliers, and that includes block blinds and Udamaki, a partnership for supply advisors, O'Neill's sportwear, sportswear for the supply of scrubs, McKeever sportswear for the supply of scrubs, and Hero Shield for the supply of advisors, and we continue to explore these opportunities. The second area for us in this, the approach is joint collaboration, and since the onset of COVID-19, we've engaged, along with representatives of the Department of Health, nationally with the Four Nations NHS Supply Chain Group, and more recently with a Four Nations Strategic Group. These meetings have been used to raise issues impacting on Northern Ireland and were appropriate to seek mutual aid from the other three home countries. It has been well publicised that Northern Ireland has received 5.5 million items of PPE from the Department of Health and Social Care nationally, but this is not the only collaborative work that has gone on. Working jointly with Wales and Scotland based on long-established working relationships, BSO has secured ongoing supply of face masks and we have received approximately 6.9 million items of PPE through the Four Nations route, with a further 5.8 million items of PPE ordered. The collaboration with Wales and Scotland alone is helping us to secure more than 6 million items of PPE. And we've also engaged with colleagues from HS Health Service Executive in Dublin. And whilst it has not yet been possible for any joint procurement to be concluded, they have very willingly shared their learning from procuring direct from China, which has assisted us in our joint work with the Department of Health, Department of Finance, and Central Procurement Directorate. That leads me on to the international procurement, which is the third element. We have engaged with the Department of Health, Department of Finance, and Central Procurement Directorate to procure PPE for the Northern Ireland public sector collaboratively on international supply routes. That goes way beyond health, and that is particularly China. 
Currently, the negotiation is at a delicate stage and is commercially sensitive. The products being considered are being subject to the same process of technical verification that the HSC has applied to any products being secured. And the company we are engaging with is approved by the Chinese government. This work is being assisted by the Northern Ireland China Bureau and the British Embassy. I appreciate that has been a quick run through, Chair. I hope it proves helpful for the questions to follow, which we will seek to answer to the best of our ability. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Liam, and uh, thank you. Um, so, a couple of questions from myself first, and I suppose I want to, I want to start out by acknowledging um, I have been speaking with a, with a range of people across the sector, and certainly in the last few days, the situation around PPE does seem to have improved. However, we will all around this room have been very conscious of the dire situation that many health and social care staff were placed in for a period of time. And I think we, we must acknowledge that, that in the fullness of time, we will, we will discover if that contributed to further spread of the virus or indeed if anyone became ill or lost their lives as a result of not having the correct, the correct equipment. So that's how important this conversation is. Um, in, in relation to that, and, I, and I, I heard you reference in the 12.6 million on April the 24th, but what modelling are you using now to prepare for a second wave? So the mistakes that were made and the lack of supply in the first episode of, or surge of this are not repeated. What modelling systems are you using and what is it that you are predicting need will be in the coming weeks and months? Okay, Chair, thanks. The modelling is actually being undertaken by the, um, a group led by Rodney Morton, who I believe was with you about two weeks ago, the Director of Nursing uh, at the uh, Public Health Agency. Um, and they are aligning that with the surge modelling group. The PPE, will then, PPE modelling will then flow from that because they will determine what activity will take place in the acute and the community sectors and determine from that the, 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 amount, the volumes of PPE that are required to support that activity. So the modelling is actually being undertaken by a separate group, and we will then be advised of the number of activities that are taking place, and from that we will extrapolate the requirement for the six items of PPE. But at this point in time, are you confident that, the, that you have the scope to purchase the, and supply and distribute the equipment that, it, that the modelling is suggested will be needed? Okay. In terms of distribution, we have a, a robust distribution chain. We have been uh, distributing through the trusts and through the trusts onto the community sector, the independent sector. And as you've highlighted yourself, that has led to the greater confidence in the last number of days that PPE is getting to the right destination to the right people. Uh, so we need to ensure that that distribution chain continues to be uh, supported and strengthened. In terms of supply, that's back to the three items which we referred to earlier, where we have the local suppliers that we brought on board, um, the supply that we are securing through the four nations, and also the very important initiative which is underta being undertaken by the Department of Finance and others in relation to securing supply internationally. Um, and in addition to that, BSO PALS is obviously undertaking its own efforts, um, and we have significant volumes of supply lined up for the next six to 12 weeks. Okay, just when you, when you mentioned the three, the three streams, I want to go through three questions just for, for relatively quick answers for you. In terms of locally led PPE, is it correct that you have now cancelled orders with local uh, suppliers of scrubs? I'll maybe ask Peter to comment on that one. Um, uh, we may have reduced the volumes. Uh, I'm not aware that we've cancelled any specific orders for scrubs. Um, uh, we did reshape some volumes based on supply that became available in from our normal supply base. Um, but we are still uh, repurposing, are still working with the repurposing uh, uh, companies McKeevers and um, uh, O'Neill's and have scrubs being supplied by them on a, a, a basis plotted out over, as Liam's described, 12 weeks. Okay, and, and given that you've acknowledged that we only had essentially one week's supply of pandemic supply here when this, when this virus hit, is that, is that wise? Should we not be now building stocks here locally? 
to ensure that future waves of this virus, or indeed any other virus that may that may come at us, will be uh, that we will have sufficient stockpiles to weather that particular surge. Chair, it's, it's Peter. Peter again. Yes, um, uh, just, just to, just to explain. Um, so, uh, we, we, we had there's one week carried at trust level. So individual trusts carry one week, okay. and then there is a stockpile held by the Department of Health, which which is is known as the PIP stockpile. Um, it is not built around weeks. It is is built based on volume and reflected previous pandemic experience. In terms of um, BSO, uh, we we carry normally carry uh, four week stock. However, um, uh, uh, when we were brought into the what I would describe as the COVID loop at the end of January, we, we immediately moved to increase those stocks to twelve week stock, um, so we could try and protect to some extent the PIP stockpile from access. And um, at that stage, the trusts were beginning to release their own stockpiles. So. Uh, in the run into to, to COVID-19, we had built stocks to 12 weeks, but those 12 weeks were based on what would be our normal usage pattern. Um, and obviously, the COVID-19 usage pattern was was entirely uh, different to to what that. that an, in, an increase, uh, an increase of a was. factor of 12, Peter, on that April 24th. Uh, well, at that time, we wouldn't have had those those figures available because we're talking about the beginning of February. But yes, as it's proven and and uh, as it's proven to work through, yes, the increase has, has been around about 12 times what we would go through in a normal week. Um, but but we've we've worked the stock up to to meet that. Um, there have definitely been pinch points and, and uh, difficulties in doing that. Okay. But. Um, uh, We've tried to manage that along with the Department of Health's emergency stockpile. So okay, and, there was more than a week stock is really the point I'm getting at. Okay, and I suppose we will all have maybe additional questions afterwards that, that can't be fact, factored in for time reasons today, and we'll, we'll come back to you with those. Um, in relation to the joint collaboration, the 250,000 gowns that went across the water, have those that were to be replaced when stocks were topped up, have those been replaced back here, and are they leg for leg gowns? Uh, uh, Peter again, Chair. Okay. <laughs> um, they, uh, they they have not been replaced yet. Um, uh, my understanding of the the position in, in uh, nationally in gowns is that it is it is fairly it is fairly difficult. Um, so we haven't had those replaced yet. Uh, we haven't run out of gowns yet, although we we have stock is challenging on gowns. Um, uh, uh, I would have to say. Okay. Well, well, we will we will want further information on how that secure how those those gowns are being secured because obviously those are one crucial element of of the well, of the equipment. Yeah. Uh, the the third then in Sorry, terms. Sure, maybe, yes. Go ahead. Just, maybe just leave, leave again. Maybe just worth mentioning that uh, gowns is one of the areas where we have secured local supply. Well, we're we're currently working with um, uh, one local company who's giving us quite a small supply. But we are uh, in discussions with another one to give us long-term security of supply. In fact, we're in discussion with two companies about long-term security of supply with local manufacturer. Okay, and I think I think we all would would uh, encourage local supply because I think one of the lessons clearly coming out of this <coughs> is the difficulty with global uh, supply lines in a situation like this. So um, I think that's something we would all be keen. Finally, quickly, in in terms of the international procurement. The EU procurement process that was missed or ignored by the British government, it was also missed here. Has that now been, has that now been linked in with so that we, will have, what, what, that we will have links into European procurement if necessary? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware, Chair, of, of any link being made on that, that front at all. I think that's a, probably a policy matter, Chair, you need to put to the Department of Health. Okay, and one last one for me before I go to members is: um, Is it correct that you are asking staff at present to stockpile single-use items for, for for future use? We're we're certainly not um, recommending stockpiling at all. Uh, our our uh, efforts are to um, enable the trust to determine where they place place stock. So we have we have uh, changed our modus operandi uh, around supply. Mm. So that it's not based on somebody um, logging in and, and grabbing whatever they can get their hands on. It's actually based on a controlled push of stock out to trusts. 
so that they can then deploy stock to wherever they believe um, there is there is a, a need. Uh, we're certainly not recommending stockpiling at, at a, a water department level. And, and no one is being advised to stockpile individual items which are designed for one-off use? Uh, not, not, no. by, not by BSO. Okay, I'm going to go to members. I'm just going to go quickly to Paula. She indicated on the stockpiling issue. Have you anything further on that? And then I'm going to go to Arlea on the phone, and then I'm going to start to come around the indications in the room. Thank well, you. Well, it's just um, it's a pity we didn't get this, the briefing in advance because I would have been able to interrogate that. But basically, I was going to the point that um, the minister in the chamber on the 24th of March said that he had authorised that day 30% release of the pandemic stock. So, what exactly does that mean? in terms of how much was there and how was it being monitored? In the context that you said that there wasn't necessarily a pandemic stock, there was more uh, uh, business use only, normal working stock? Yeah. The, uh, the, 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 the pandemic stockpile is, is actually owned by the Department of Health. Um, and uh, so whilst, whilst BSO um, uh, looks after the housekeeping of it we we don't have we don't actually own it and we we have to seek approval to to have it deployed um, and we and we do that um, in tandem with um, looking at our own our own stock levels um, and our, in our warehouse which obviously we have raised to try and uh, cope with covid um, and uh, stocks held at, at, tr at a local level in trust so we are currently monitoring um, bulk stock held at trusts uh, our own stock levels and the the PIP stockpile. So when the minister announced he had released 30% of that, that 30% of the stockpile was released into BSO's uh, stock um, and then uh, pushed out to trusts um, based on on need. Um, it didn't all get pushed out immediately because that would would in some instances overwhelm um, the the areas that the stock's being stored on in trusts. Um, but it got pushed out gradually based on based on need at trust level. Can I just have a supplementary quickly? Um, and, and where would we find the information of, of the quantity of the trust or of the Department of Health stockpile pandemic stockpile? Is there, where, is, where is that audit held? You would you would be able to access that through the Department of Health as the owners of the product through the emergency planning branch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, Orlea, are you there on the phone? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Peter and Liam. Um, just three three quick points, questions. Um, first of all, the Health Minister um, announced that, that they were going to be carrying out a review into the supply and the distribution of um, PPE under the CMO. So I just wanted to ask, firstly, what specific engagement um, has the BSO had with the CMO on this piece of work? Secondly, um, we've raised this a few times at committee level with, with the Minister and the CMO around a, a recent article in The Guardian referring to um, internal stock checks that was basically showing that item after item um, was listed as out of stock. So my second question is, um, could you share with this committee um, any internal stock checks of PPE that you would hold from January up until um, the present day? And just finally, um, you had mentioned, um, Liam, I think it was yourself earlier, around the, the total of 60 million um, PPE items that have been um, procured. I just wanted to ask, um, how do you outline the types of items that are counted as PPE equipment? And I'm just thinking, I don't know if any of you have picked up on the BBC Panorama programme recently, which gave the example that gloves were being counted individually. So if that was the case here, you know, that, that 60 million figure could be massively reduced. So maybe just a wee bit of clarity on that. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thank you. Um, in terms of the items, the 60 million, it does include gloves. It's the six items that I referred to. Is there a bit of interference? Earlier? Yeah. Could have been, are you okay? Can you hear it okay? We can hear you. There was some interference, but I think it's okay now, Liam. Go ahead. Oh, no, thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, 60 million of items of PPE could include gloves, and we can certainly break, provide you with a breakdown of what we've procured. Um, Sorry, the gloves. But see, just on that, on the gloves, what the question was, are the gloves being counted? I know it, it sounds almost silly, but are the oh, gloves being that. counted individually? Yeah, no, have, coming to that, happy to do it. They are being counted individually because they are not sold as pairs, they are not used as pairs. 
if you go into the surgery or the uh, clinic, there's a box of gloves and you pick out one or two as you need. And if you need two gloves, you pick out two gloves. So when we issue them, they are issued as you know a box of 100 or whatever else. And so therefore, when we count them, we count them the same way. I mean, there's no attempt to you know, sort of hide anything on this. That's how gloves are used within the healthcare setting. Yes, is that OK on that one? Thank you, yes. OK. In terms of the Guardian article, we have a system, as we said before, of electronic materials management where people order at trust level, sorry, ward level and um, department level within the trusts. Um, and we provide them with up-to-date information on stock availability at all points in time. And during COVID, we provided them with that information likewise. But we also, as Peter said, moved to a system where we were pushing stock to their emergency planning department. So the information that was presented there was to guide and advise people as to how to best access their PPE. Um, we have modified some of the, the language that we used uh, to make it very clear when, for example, um, you would have had previously a mask and a visor as one item. Um, and when that went out of stock, we pointed people towards buying a mask and a visor or ordering a mask and a visor as two separate items. But so we did have to say the one you would normally buy is out of stock. However, the alternative is here and this is how you get it. So that was the purpose behind that document. And it was a simple tool to guide and, and aid people in their uh, sourcing of PPE. Um, happy to share with you internal stock levels. My interpretation of that earlier is um, from a period of time to give you an indication of the stock levels within BSO PALS and the trusts uh, running forward over a day. We, 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 have, um, we wouldn't have trust stock levels from, from January. Um, uh, we would have trust stock levels, uh, I think, from maybe March or April, something like that. So Probably around about the middle of April. Them, yeah. Well, we're very happy to share what we have with the committee. Okay. Brilliant, Liam. Thank you. Okay. And a question the question on CMO engagement. Yep, on the review. Oh, the review. Okay, sorry. Yes, review. Uh, we have not seen any output yet from that. Um, the engagement with the PSO was principally through interview and uh, visit. Uh, the interview, well, the interview was with Peter, uh, on our head of logistics. Okay, Peter and the head of logistics. Um, and I think there was also a visit to our warehouse. So, and our own warehouse in Boucher Crescent. Uh, so that was the engagement that they had. There was some uh, follow-up questions which came to Peter and myself in relation to modelling, um, but they were not. Uh, I was not directly involved in our interview in relation to it. Uh, so we provided the follow-up information that we had to the um, interviewees. Oh, sorry, the interviewers. Is that? Uh, does that cover the question? Yes, Liam, thanks very much. I appreciate those answers. Okay, okay thank you. I'm now going to uh, Deputy Chair Pam. Thank you, and thank you, Liam, and your, your colleagues for your attendance at the committee today. Um, uh, just uh, a few questions for you here. Um, in terms of distribution and delivery, um, does the BSO envisage any practical support of um, the Army for distribution in any second or, or further waves of this virus. Um, and then I wanted to ask you about um, how carers who, I'm thinking more in terms of carers who may uh, be caring for their loved ones who have um, maybe uh, stopped other carers coming into the home in order to protect those individuals. How and are they able to access PPE um, for that purpose? And um, my, my last question to you would be in terms of the um, independent sector. Uh, and I wanted to ask you in what circumstances are offers of support suitable for use in private, or sorry, in, in, for use in nursing and residential care homes, but not by trusts? And is that is that a quality issue, um, and is it reflective of quantity offered? Uh, if I maybe take Peter here, um, uh, Pam, if you don't mind, if I maybe take the the, the first and the last, and are you happy to take the the, the cares? Um, yeah. Um, 
So in terms of distribution and delivery, um, so so far to date, we have been able to manage that within our, our existing arrangements um, using our own fleet of vehicles and a third-party distribution company. Um, uh, we we have have not um, we have not required um, military support uh, at, at this point, um, and uh, was at this point don't envisage it. That, that 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 doesn't mean to say at some point that mightn't change. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, you, you'll be aware that on the, on the, the mainland, um, there is a, a, a greater involvement from from um, the military. Um, uh, we have a, a different type of arrangement here, um, uh, and uh, we believe it enables us to get our, our product out quite quickly um, uh, compared to the, to the mainland. Um, uh, so at this point in time, we haven't, <coughs> haven't needed it. We've been able to cope, um, uh, but but who knows what a, a second surge might bring? <coughs> Excuse me. And in, in terms of the, uh, the, the the question of product quality and and the independent sector or, or, or volume, uh, I mean, the answer the answer is uh, in terms of um, largely volume. First of all, so, so some of the some of the volumes we are looking to buy. Um, we get sharp intakes of breath from companies when, when we are when we are, when they come and offer us something and we say, well, can you can you supply that a million a week or two million a week over over a 12 week period, um, or or indeed larger uh, volumes? Um, uh, quality uh, we we test the quality of product going into um, a, 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 that we are going to procure, um, and it has to meet a particular standard. And, and Liam outlined that in, in, in his, his earlier his earlier uh, brief. Um, so it, it is. It is uh, would be unusual for us to be saying um, you can't use that in an acute setting, but there would be circumstances. Uh, sorry, it would be unusual for us to say you can't use that in an acute uh, uh, setting, but you can use in a community setting. But there are circumstances where that would apply. So, uh, for example, there may be a, a product that, that wouldn't meet our standards in terms of for use um, in, a, in a, a high-risk situation, an aerosol generating procedure situation. So there may be gowns that would be suitable for use um, in a community setting, but not suitable in, in, an, uh, in an acute setting. Or there may be um, products like scrubs that would be uh, would require to go through laundry tests, and laundry testing in an acute setting would be, um, uh, Let's say m m more rigorous or, or more um, demanding on the scrub um, than potentially uh, community use. So the, the, there, there can be circumstances where we would say yes, we could use that with an HSC, um, or we sorry, we couldn't use it with an HSC, but it might be suitable in a community type setting. Okay, um, moving on now, members. But we're not going to get through all members. If 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 Chair, everyone sorry, takes three, we're going to have to concentrate on two questions each. If we get an additional round, we'll come back. Chair, I think it is important, but we get the answer to the the carers at home and access to PPE. Yep. So access for yep. care homes. Uh, I'm afraid, Chair, that would be a matter for uh, the the policy branch to determine. At this point in time, PSO, as I said, supplies trusts. And via the trust, we provide then uh, they then provide on to the independent sector. I would envisage that a similar arrangement may apply in relation to carers. We would not have a list of carers, nor would we be able to determine what the requirements were. So I think that would have to be some, through some sort of a clinical engagement. But it might be best directed to the policy branch. Thank you, okay. um, Alex. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of procurement, um, do you, do you operate by same rules during this virus epidemic? Uh, is, it, it, is it value for money and the quality of equipment? Um, or what, what way are you, you buying things in for uh, PPE? And um, you mentioned about procurement um, blocks with uh, the rest of the, the UK, like Scotland, Wales, and England. Um, has this provided you with a quicker channel of getting PPE in? Um, and value for money as well. <coughs> Excuse me, it's, it's, it's Peter again, um, Alex. Uh, in, in terms of the procurement process, um, we, we have we have made use of the provisions within the, the, the current regulations, which in, in circumstances that are described as unforeseeable, and I think none of us foresaw how, how bad COVID would really be. Um, 
they they permit us to to uh, procure uh, with negotiation rather than open competition, and, and we have applied those rules to enable us to take advantage of of uh, procuring goods quickly. All of the goods we have been procuring have gone through some sort of a technical assessment, um, uh, and that's generally carried out by by um, folks with a, with a clinical background. Uh, either um, uh, infection control nursing staff or clinical specialists working in, in Northern Trust's Medicines Optimization Innovation Centre. So any product we buy goes through an assessment process. Um, it's the same type of process we would use if we were running a tender. So if we were competing a, under normal circumstances, we would assess the product in the same sorts of ways. Um, we've obviously had to, to find ways to fast track that as best we can and, and work with colleagues particularly in, in, in uh, Northern Trust, to, to, to do that. Um, in, in procurement, we, we have what we call the five rights, which are the right goods in the right place, the right time, the right quality, the right price. And in, in reality, if you haven't got the first four, the, the cost of the product uh, becomes, becomes immaterial. Um, so our focus has been on trying to secure the right quality of goods um, uh, and have them available when they're absolutely needed, and to do that at the, at the best possible price. Um, uh, 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 prices in the market at the moment are significantly different to what we would experience normally. In, in terms of the wider collaboration, um, uh, we've had very close relationships with both Scotland and Wales for, for many years, uh, uh, and uh, we've worked with them uh, on procurements principally led by, by, um, uh, by Wales, uh, in terms of the pricing being achieved, it's, it's not substantially different to the prices we are being um, uh, offered from, from uh, at least the competitive prices we're being offered um, at the moment. Uh, but uh, I think what it does what it does help us do is, is spread the load in terms of trying to uh, chase down possible sources, follow leads, and um, uh, uh, you know maximise, if you like, the resource available to um, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, uh, and, and indeed to an extent England, um, uh, in trying to secure goods. I hope that answers your question. Yep, thanks. Thank you. Um, now going to Jerry. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I think, generally speaking, that the PP approach has been worrying, and, and uh, I think it's been a botched approach to it, where we're hearing orders were placed and then they weren't placed, and then we're relying on the market and uh, orders are. Uh, slow at best to come in or they're not coming in at all um, and the same time we're, we're hearing companies having large private companies that are not essential having large supplies of PPE coming in but still frontline workers frontline staff still don't have PPE so that's that's very very concerning um, I think there are serious questions over whether we were prepared uh, before this crisis around stockpiling um, the Guardian as well um, has indicated that the UK government uh, 325 million pounds uh, was wiped off uh, the value of their um, stockpile equipment, uh, which was a 40% reduction in the last six years. So, um, they're also they were advised in 2017 um, to stockpile. Um, so, I want to ask whether that was uh, followed up upon here. Uh, the advice to stockpile, uh, and if it was followed up upon, uh, um, some evidence uh, and examples of that, please. Yeah. I'm afraid, Jerry, that would be a policy issue again to the Emergency Planning Branch, as we stated earlier. Our role in relation to the, uh, the PIP stockpile is to hold it for the department and to manage its release. Uh, we are not responsible for determining what's in it uh, or indeed the, the purchasing of it. So with all due respect, I think that needs to go back to the, to the policy branch. With, with respect, I mean, I don't think it's a policy question to ask whether advice to stockpile was implemented in 2017. The, the fact that there was a stockpile indicates that advice to stockpile was implemented. The question as to whether it was sufficient is a matter for the policy branch because they are responsible for what was put in the stockpile. I can assure you that, what, that the uh, stockpile that was held within Northern Ireland was held and managed by BSO in line with their requirements. Okay, I'm going to Colin. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Chair, the, the, the two issues that I was interested in following up is the pursuit of local um, sort of offers of PPE. Um, we were certainly advised here to come via a committee address and then eventually through to a Department of Finance 
address, which was then forwarded to the Department of Health. And I know that I have a number of uh, constituents that offered um, supplies and had some supply change, which I forwarded in. And to date, they haven't received any response or any contact. C can I ask you, just, um, Liam, to give us a detail of what your part in that process is? Because obviously, there was a time we were being told that there was very limited supplies of PPE. We on the ground were being given contacts and forwarding into the centre, and it appears that it's gone into just a big black hole, and, and we haven't heard anything back from it. And then, just um, a secondary issue in terms of human resource: um, Do you have any um, sort of input there? Because there's some staff within the healthcare sector that are telling us that they are being asked to go in uh, to work in joint offices uh, and asked to go in and be on duty whenever, in reality, they could carry out those that work either. A, um, from their home, or B, in locations closer to home, which would allow them to be able to not have to travel and not take the risk that goes with that. Thank you. Okay, Colin, in relation to the second point, in terms of um, people and where they're working and working remotely, I'm responsible for the people within my organisation, which is around about 1,400 personnel. Um, and I mean, this was quite difficult to begin uh, as we've gone through it, but I can assure you now that. We have um, dramatically increased the number of people working remotely. We have also engaged in social distancing in offices um, and in other environments to, in order to protect the staff and enable them to continue to fulfil their functions. Um, and another part of the BSO is the uh, Information Technology Service. And they have been uh, working extremely diligently to increase the uh, the bandwidth capacity and the actual um, equipment to enable people to work from home. Um, so I can tell you, that, you know, within my area, yes, we have done that. All of the other organisations, likewise, have looked at, at how best to continue to provide their services in a business continuity mode by but taking due re recognition of all of the restrictions that are in place. Okay. Um, Peter, maybe the best place to explain our role yeah. in the process for local procurement. Uh, just to highlight that, as I said before, there have been some very good examples of um, uh, positive engagement there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as Liam, Liam uh, referenced in, in, in his kind of opening remarks, um, we, we've received uh, around about 1,230. Um, uh, offers uh, on individual uh, types of, of PPE from around about 400 different suppliers. Um, and we've gone through uh, a, a, a triage process. So when they, they come in, they sometimes come in direct to us, um, which, which we then log in action. Um, they come in through uh, a, a, a central uh, email addresses, um, and there's a triage carried out. Uh, by colleagues in CPD who will uh, determine whether or not it's something is, it, it may be of, of greater greater help to health um, or whether it's something that might be of greater assistance just due to volumes generally um, for other parts of the public sector in Northern Ireland. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, when we, when we uh, receive a, 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 an offer, it's, it's logged um, and it goes out to uh, our buyers who are dealing with the individual uh, product lines. They will then uh, assess it to see whether or not the, the, the potentially the volumes being talked about and, and the approach are are, um, uh, are the sorts of volumes that we we need, um, and uh, will then make a contact if they are. Uh, we'll seek to get details of the product uh, and, and involved, data sheets of the product, samples of the product, and then get those into the Medicines Optimization Innovation Centre for assessment. Um, if if they uh, pass muster, we then talk to the the, uh, the company making the offer about terms. Many of the offers are people who have contacts in China. The, the position in China has changed significantly during the COVID the COVID outbreak, um, where China uh, the Chinese government um, is certifying companies for export. Um, and not all not all companies uh, who who are who are Making offers through through intermediary, intermediaries, or act, actually have that government certification. So we've had a number of examples where we've we've gone some distance with 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 the offers, and and then when it has come to the point of us being able to do business, actually the company in China hasn't got government approval to export, 
Um, and that's no fault of the, the, the folks who have brought the offer to us. That's a, a change in position by the Chinese government, um, which came into place on the 1st of April. Hope that, hope that answers for you. Okay. Um, go on to Pat now. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the CMO announced at the committee last week that uh, there's an intention to recruit between three and 600 people uh, to become involved in contact tracing. Is BSO involved in that recruitment process? And if you are, could you give me uh, uh, an update of where things stand at the minute? And secondly, uh, is there any experience of shortages of drugs coming from the EU, particularly uh, morphine? Thank you. Okay, Pat, thanks. <clears throat> um, BSO runs the recruitment services as well. Um, I haven't got the detail in relation to the three to 600 people. I know it's being led by a team in the public health agency. Um, we have been involved with them in relation to provision of the technology and possibly accommodation for these people. But at this stage, um, I'm not aware that we have been directly approached to initiate a recruitment. Uh, I believe they may be looking at um, other personnel. Uh, I know mention has been made of um, environmental health people and students. So I'm not at this stage sure what the route is. Apologies for that. Uh, but um, what I can say is that the recruitment team within BSO I've been working with the Trust again through this to uh, introduce streamlined measures to assist with the uh, provision of staff. Um, shortage of drugs, Peter, maybe best place? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer. Um, the, the supply chain for drugs is not actually managed by, by BSO. Um, supply chain for drugs is managed directly by uh, individual trusts uh, and the Department of Health. Um, so I, I, I couldn't give you a definitive answer on, on drug shortages, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alan? Uh, thanks, Chair. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, worrying suggestions have been made uh, that Northern Ireland has perhaps been uh, treated as a poor relation in regards to share of equipment uh, supplies coming through the four-nation approach. Have you any sense that this has been the case, and are you happy with the level of support and cooperation you have been receiving to date through the Four Nation approach? Um, it's Peter here. Um, uh, we, we find ourselves in a, in a unique situation. I'm, I'm, I'm one of, one of, one of um, the committee members mentioned earlier on uh, the, the mutual aid we provided to, to England on, on gowns. Um, we, we, we have been uh, probably in many instances better placed than England um, uh, and some of the other four nations from time to time around having stocks of products. Um, that, that may be a little scary, but, but that, that has been the case. We haven't had any problems um, accessing stock um, uh, nationally other than the national availability of those stock lines. Um, so uh, when, when we've asked, if they have been, if they have had sufficient supply, they have, uh, they have generally provided. Um, uh, they haven't always had uh, supply available, um, and all of the, all of the, as I would call it, the Celtic fringe, um, uh, Wales and Scotland and ourselves uh, have been in a similar position, um, as have as have organisations within England where they haven't been able to to, to access product simply because there isn't sufficient product available. But I don't think we've been treated any differently, would be my view. Thank you. And uh, Paula, I had put, brought Paula in to start, but I'm conscious she did ask one question only, so I'll bring her back in for a second. I was re really just to um, get clarity on this. You said that there was one week's supply. What, could you repeat what you actually said at that? Okay, let me try and find it. That's the, the, sorry, that, that's the stockpile, stockpile that trust held under pandemic planning. Yeah, yeah. The sto, the sto, so uh, under under a business as usual um, uh, preparation for pandemic stocks, trusts carry seven to ten days stock, um, uh, uh, which essentially should see them over the the, the initial um, hit if you like, of a pandemic, and then there is a stockpile held by the Department of Health, 
Um, normally, in, in normal business, so uh, what I'm describing is the 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 stockpile for for a pandemic. So that's a stockpile of a of a range of defined PPE. Uh, under normal business, for, for, for products generally in use within the hospital, the stock levels would be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, around about 24 days, um, and those are managed um, through an electronic materials management process. The stockpile is slightly different, and it relates only to pandemic preparedness at trust level. Okay, so but you're confident that. That we're we're, we're so, over the worst of that now that we've actually got the stuff that we need. Yeah, they, so I, I, let me re-describe it slightly. So there's a pandemic stockpile held at trusts, which is which is in preparation for the pandemic occurring. It's not supposed to see the trust through anything other than the first seven, ten days of that pandemic. But some of the products in that, so things like type two R masks, <clears throat> uh, gloves, aprons, would already be held at trusts. Uh, in, as part of normal business stock. So what they typically have is a slightly larger stock than seven to ten days simply because of what is currently available within their, their normal ward stores. Um, that, that seven to ten days is long since gone. So what we, what we provide out to trusts on a regular drops throughout the, weeks, uh, throughout the week is to enable them to, to deal with the, the day-to-day pressures they have. That, that okay. pandemic stock by that 10 days is, is long since gone. Okay. Um, I want to go back to something that was said there earlier. I think it was yourself, Liam, that, that you said that uh, in many ways that some of the elements of this were unforeseeable. And I want to challenge that because I don't think they actually were unforeseeable. They may have been unforeseen, and that's an entirely different matter. But actually, I don't even think they were unforeseen, to be quite honest, because if you look at exercise sickness, in 2016, which looked at a range of of options around pandemic. There was significant learning gained from that. There were, I believe, four recommendations, one of which that countries would build up their surge capacity and surge capability. So I don't think this has been unforeseeable. I don't think it's been unforeseen. I think the planning has not been adequate. And I think that's something that you as an organization need to take on board in terms of the future, future waves of this pandemic. We're not out of the woods here by any means. If anything, we, we may be at a stage where we can now at least take a look at some of the lessons that have been learned. So I think, I think from the committee point of view, it's vital that those lessons are learned. It's a wee bit concerning here today. First of all, as some of the members have mentioned, that, that the briefing could have been, I think, provided and curtailed, curtailed give, give a bit more time for questions. So that's one thing. Also, some of the key questions were then referred on to policy decisions. And I think that now raises the issue that policy, maybe decisions here, have been taken in a way which have left staff unprotected. And I think that's, that's unforgivable and cannot be allowed to happen again. So I am proposing that the committee will actually now ask for the policy input in terms of the questions that we have raised today that we will ask for the department to come back to us with, with an explanation and outlining what those policies were and what they are now to ensure this doesn't happen again. We are under some pressure of time today as a result of, of other meetings taking place. Sir, could I, could I just maybe ask a question there in terms of... Uh, no, I'm sorry, because I haven't, give, I haven't given any other members a chance to do that, and I'm going to be fair to everyone. on what you've uh, just said. Okay. Uh, just in terms of the policy department, who, who has ultimate responsibility for the policy department and decisions that they make? Yep. Yeah. Did you get that question? Yeah, sorry. I mean, the key relationship for us would be to the emergency planning branch of the Department of Health. Um, and I think that's the route in to asking any of your questions, and certainly in relation to the PIP stockpile, which has been uh, one of the key points, that would be the, the route to res resolution in those. Um, I'm happy to confirm, Chair, that um, there, in my view, there were elements of this, and there are elements of this, which were unforeseen, maybe not unforeseeable, the closure of China and the supply chain, the impact on supply chain. However, we will um, work with the rest of the, health, com uh, with the health, health community and yourselves to identify the learning from this and to apply that learning, and we will seek to be better prepared as we go forward, uh, while we continue to respond to the challenges that face us now. Um, and we would give that full commitment. Okay. Um, 
Okay, well, thank you for the briefing today. I think this is an issue, like many of the others, that we will we will need to come back to. Um, there are un, unanswered questions, there are outstanding concerns. But thank you very much for the for the briefing you have given us today, and we wish you all the best for your work in the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you. BSO. Thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to take a very quick break there, just to get the next the next caller dialed in. Could we give like a five minute break and step back? Thank you. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. We're okay, members. We're now resuming our meeting, and can I advise members that departmental officials are here today via teleconference to continue with last week's discussion on the departmental budget. I refer members to tab six of the pack and to the clerk's memo and the updated research paper, which are tab six of your table papers. So I'd like to welcome back to the committee today. Uh, Neela Lloyd, Director of Finance. You there, late, Neela? Hello, yes. Good morning. Hi, morning. Uh, Miss Bridget Worth, Investment Director. Bridget, can you hear us? Yes, good morning. Hi, and Miss Kira Dolan, Director of Transformation. Are you there, yes. Kira? Hello, all. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose um, maybe, Neela, just, do you want to add anything or return to any of last week's questions? There were some questions we had got through last week and there was some additional information. Do you want to add anything to that before we move to members' questions? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thought it might be helpful to actually just make a few brief comments by way of follow-up um, to last week's discussion. So, firstly, in terms of Budget 2021, in February, the committee received a briefing paper which indicated that the projected total funding requirement to maintain existing services and meet new decade new approach priorities was £661 million. Pounds. This figure included the executive's commitment of £170 million in relation to pay parity and safe staffing. That paper advised that we needed a £492 million pound increase on the 1920 budget to meet the inescapable costs of maintaining existing service levels with no growth. In other words, an additional funding requirement of 322 million plus the 170 million commitment for pay parity and safe staffing. In addition, that paper advised that we needed 169 million to meet further new decade new approach priorities. So together, the 492 million pounds for the inescapable cost of maintaining existing services and the 169 million for new decade new approach resulted in the £661 million pounds total funding requirement referred to at that time. Moving forward then, the comparable inescapable costs of maintaining existing services are currently assessed as £471.2 million, as set out in Part B of your briefing pack last week. In other words, there has been a decrease of £20.8 million against the £492 million pound figure advised in February. This decrease is largely as a result of continued refinements to cost pressures and also reflects a revised cost pressure for safe staffing to £5 million to match the budget provided in the proposed 2021 budget outcome. We continue to keep all of the cost pressures under review and will continue to engage with our key stakeholders to review and refine all of our cost pressures. Turning then to savings, in developing our annual financial plan against the backdrop of significant financial constraints, it has been necessary for annual savings targets to be set. The targets are set to support a break-even position. The savings targets for both 1920 and 2021 have been identified on a risk-based judgment, which takes account of, for example, the progress of current savings targets, the capacity to deliver further savings, potential impact on services, the level of financial pressures faced and the likely budget outcome. The Department's 1920 financial plan included the need to realise some £77 million of savings and other measures, £20 million of which was in respect of medicines optimisation savings, with almost £50 million to be delivered across trusts, and the balance made up from budget reductions across a number of areas, including departmental and ALB budgets and slippage. However, in setting these targets, the Department recognised that the ability to deliver savings is not unlimited. In 1920, the Department had been clear that the target for trusts would be a significant challenge, given the increased demand and the scale of the financial pressures faced across health and social care. The Department is on track to achieve a break-even position, including funding of 1920 COVID-19 requirement. This is supported by further slippage occurring including as a result of a downturn in some services as a result of COVID-19. 
We are still reviewing the position as we work through provisional light term. Whilst a break-even position is expected to be delivered, this has largely been through non-recurrent measures with a significant reliance on slippage. This is not unusual. Consequently, savings and cost reductions have not been delivered as originally envisaged. A key area for savings continues to be medicines optimisation, with over the last four years, 130 million of savings or cost reductions being delivered. In 1920, it is estimated that over 32 million of savings have been delivered as part of the department's medicines optimisation programme. This is 12 million pounds in excess of the 20 million pound target set, with the 12 million pounds contributing to the overall forecast break-even position. Of the 77 million pounds savings targets for 1920, it is estimated that 26.5 million is recurrently deliverable. However, in line with the approach taken in previous years, it had been assumed that 77 million pounds of savings would be recurrent in 2021. In terms of 2021 financial year, a 72 million pound target for new savings measures, cost reductions and other opportunities has been factored into the financial plan. This includes a further 20 million pound target for medicines optimization, a 1% target for trusts of 50 million and a 2 million pounds recognizing budget reductions across the department. The department has previously acknowledged the risks associated with the delivery of this target particularly in the context of the recurrent savings from 1920. Further, the need to respond to the COVID-19 challenges increases the delivery risk, as there will be little opportunity to lead on and progress any measures in the early months of the new financial year. However, the need to respond to COVID-19 makes financial planning significantly more uncertain, and it would be expected that there will be significant movements in costs and funding requirements as a result of disruption to existing services. To put the fluidity of forecasts into context, just half a percent movement in budget terms is a change of £30 million, given the Department's overall proposed budget resource of almost £6.2 billion. The impact of COVID-19 is such as to add further uncertainty to financial forecasts, making financial planning across an already complex and dynamic system even more challenging. We will, of course, continue to closely monitor and manage the 2021 financial position, albeit recognising that there is likely to be significant volatility in financial forecasts for at least three months in light of COVID-19. Bridget, Kieran, and I would be happy then to take any questions you may have on the information that we've provided. OK, uh, thank you. Um, I suppose just from myself, first of all, I see that there, there's a figure of £5 million in accounted for around sa- staffing. Now, Safe staffing and workforce planning was a significant issue before the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's, it's going to clearly be a major issue afterwards. So that £5 million that's been set aside for safe staffing, can you expand for us on how that figure was arrived at, and if it's ne- likely to need revised, considering the impact of the current pandemic? OK, in terms of the £5 million, the £5 million for safe staffing, um, we had... Um, Estimated the requirement for safe staffing of the in the region of five to ten million, um, and the executive has provided um, the five million pounds, which has been allocated to us by way of the proposed budget outcome for 2021. So there was an uncertainty then within that range of five to ten million pounds. Um, we have secured five million pounds, which has been ring fenced for safe staffing. So that will be the um, money that we have available to us in 2021 in respect of of um, that element of the budget. Okay, but, but how did your five million how did your five to ten million figure arise? How did you estimate that? What was that based on? Um I believe it was based on the um staffing concerns that were raised as part of the um uh, commitments in resolving the industrial dispute um back at the earlier part of this year. Um, I don't have the detail um, in terms of that. Uh, it would be policy colleagues that would have had the detail and provided that in terms of supporting that five to ten million pounds. Um, but that was the estimate that we had put forward um, a couple of months ago. Um, and as I said, we have secured the five million pounds, which will be ring fenced for that purpose. Okay. And could you get the policy the policy information to us in terms of how? I'm that... happy. I'm happy. Yes, to bring that back and to consider that. Yes. Okay, and uh, just for me there, and then as well, the last one for me is, 
In terms of reform of adult social care, part of people has an identified 32 million need within the figures. How is that broken down, and is that going to be implemented in stages, or how is that going to be implemented? I think the breakdown of that was split over two particular areas. Um, part of that was to do with sustainable pay levels, and part of it was to do with um, training. Um, if I recollect that, there was a split um, between the 32 million. Um, again, I would need to cor correspond with my policy colleagues just to be able to get you that absolute clarity on the, the two elements. But in broad terms, it was split um, over those two areas in terms of the overall 32 million. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go to members now. I have some indications. Could I ask members maybe in the initial round to go with, with your, your key question? First of all, we can follow up, and we will be following up, I think, on budgetary issues for quite some time anyway. But if we can just go with one question each at this point, and if we can squeeze in another quick round, we'll do that. So I, um, I'll, have, I'll go to Pam as Deputy Chair there, and then I'll, scoot, I'll go to our lay on the phone, and then I'll come back into the room. So, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Neil. And Bridget and Kira for your attendance today, as usual. Um, in terms of the um, NDNA, is there any indication uh, that the executive or UK or Irish governments will deliver any of the um, 160 million needed to implement the new decade commitments um, not funded by this proposal? Can I just get some clarity there, if that's okay, if I may? Um, do you mean in respect of the £169 million across all the NDNI uh -huh. priorities? Uh, yes. Um, again, it would be very difficult for me to say. Um, I would have to um, move on for, for finance colleagues and Department of Finance, but um, all I can say is in terms of the, the settlement, or the proposed settlement that we have, we have not been provided with any funding in respect of those areas that make up that £169 million, which is why we have um, reflected that as being a shortfall in our templates to you. Just for clarity, no indication of additional monies from any of those sources? No, I'm not aware of any indications of any additional monies in respect of that. I'm just reflecting on the, the proposed budget settlement that we got for £399.6 million. That does not extend to the various areas that make up the, the list of the NDNA priorities for the department, the 169 figure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Orlea, your question, please. Yes, thank you. And I actually was only going to ask one because I didn't mean to jump in earlier with three questions, so sorry if I took time off other people. Neatly um, done, Orly. You yeah. got away with it because you're on the phone, I think. <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, thanks for um, the, the update. Um, just around the, the commission and plan, um, how, how do you think the, the commission and plan directive will be affected for the 2021 um, period? And I suppose the concern is, do you think there's any programmes of CAR in particular that are likely to be disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 um, crisis? I'm really thinking some of the programmes, particularly around mental health, um, maternity and prevention, are you getting any sense that any of those maybe take a greater hit in this budget? Uh, it's, nearly here, it's nearly here again. Yes, in terms of the commissioning plan... Commissioning plan. Oh, sorry, I'm just getting a bit of feedback there. Um, so, yes, I mean, that's the commissioning plan direction is the formal legal direction from the Department of the Board to prepare the commissioning plan, which really, as you know, sets out how the Board will commission services to support the Minister's vision and priorities for health and social care and how the financial allocations from the Department will be deployed to deliver these priorities. And you're, you're right in terms of your, your point in relation to COVID-19. Um, the, 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 there's a suspension on that work in terms of the 2021 commissioning plan direction. However, um, work will still take place in terms of the Health and Social Care Board and the Trust working collectively to plan and deliver services in line with the commissioning plan direction for 1920, prioritising patient safety and clinical risk. Um, so hopefully that um, sets that scene out for you there, Olea. In terms then of disproportionately impacting and uh, in terms of programmes of care, again, it's very, very difficult um, at this point for, for me to comment on that, um, given that the proposed budget settlement um, has yet, yet to be kind of 
finalised, if you like, but step one in terms of being voted through the committee, or sorry, the assembly next week, apologies. And secondly, then um, that, that piece of work then will, will involve the Health and Social Care Board um, taking through their normal processes around um, the commissioning plan that I've just described. And then that in turn will set out the um, plan for the year ahead in terms of programmes of care based on baselines and based on the additional um, budget allocation that we have got. So it's all very fluid. I can't be certain and prescriptive around um, impacts on a particular programme of care. Um, all of that will have to be um, worked through in terms of the, the, the coming weeks weeks ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jerry? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I mean, obviously, you'll be aware that most, most accounts and economists are saying that there's going to be a deep recession or depression, a, a big uh, contraction of the economy by 7.5 or, or 10 percent, some accounts say. I, I'm concerned there's aspects of, of this budget, um, at least relating, pertaining to health, which has measures in it which are going to reduce uh, the health service, and people are obviously rightly clapping for it, but we're being asked to consider uh, reducing parts of the NHS. Um, so, in regards to the savings, um, the 50 million reduction in, in trusts funding, I mean, I, I'm concerned about that. Um, that's happening at any time, but especially because we don't know the detail of where that's going to be. Uh, and in regards to the, the shortfall in the money within the NA commitments, is there going to be a further reduction um, uh, on top of that if that money, uh, to meet the commitments, is there going to be further reductions on top of that £72 million? Pounds? Yeah. Okay, Jerry. Thanks, uh, panel. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, no, no. Sorry, a panel. I'm calling. Sorry, right. sorry Al. Right. Uh, so, our, our department panel, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, just picking up in terms of the, the savings point. Again, as I said in my opening comments, yes, it is a challenging target. Yes, it's 50 million pounds for going into 2021 against the backdrop of savings not being achieved or currently from 1920. So, it is absolutely a challenging. Um, target um, and it one that, that will be very, very closely monitored um, and it is one that, that's at risk. Um, and again, in terms of process, it will be for the Health and Social Care Board working through their processes over coming weeks to um, determine the, um, the makeup, the breakdown even of that across the, the, the trusts themselves. So um, yes, I, again, just to accept that there is fluidity in the overarching position, it's very difficult to um, comment again prescriptively um as you can imagine at this stage it, it is impacted by so many things um not least COVID 19 um in terms of of the downturn and some of those services so i think until you know I suppose what i would say is that the situation is going to remain particularly fluid and volatile for the next probably the next couple of months um as we work through this um both in terms of services and in terms of the financial implications Okay, thank you. Paula? Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel. My question is about the um, de department's template response, which identified that it would, um, was going to spend about between 508 to 588 million of additional costs arising from COVID-19. Um, my understanding from the papers is that 205 million has been received to date, um, and I'm just wondering what happens if all the rest of that money is not forthcoming from the UK Treasury? How is that gap going to be filled? Thank you. Okay, again, it's Nina here. If I can pick that one up. Yes, I mean, we, we, the Department very much welcomes that initial allocation of £205 million to respond to COVID-19. And we also acknowledge that there's a further £49 million which is being held centrally by the Department of Finance for Health and Social Care. And on top of that, in addition to that, there's a further 150 million is also being held centrally by, by Department of Finance for, for PPE. Um, so we have, as you're right, as you said, we have received that allocation of 205 million, um, which will, will is very welcome and will go some way to the costs that we've set out here. But I think I would also um, re sort of respond by saying again, the estimates that you have in your template pack of the 508 million to 558 million for resource pressures are very uncertain. Again, given the fluidity, they are, you know, we've based those projections, we've based those cost estimates on high-level assumptions, including timeframes, and it is likely that the volatility of estimates will continue in this context. As I said, probably within the, at least the next three months. 
Um, what I would say to you is that you know officials from my department here, with finance officials, will also continue to work very closely as we are doing with Department of Finance colleagues and across the health and social care to to support and, and define the requirements and and opportunities to meet the pressures. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the COVID-19 priority is all about right care for patients and right support for staff, and funding is not an obstacle to that. Okay, thank you. And Alex? Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm concerned about the, the 50 million target for trust to have to save. Um, it's always the trusts that seem to get the brunt of it, and that's where all the work's really, really done. That's essential. Um, can you outline what savings the trusts are actually going to be making? Are there any plans to close any departments or units or care homes or, or anything um, so that we are aware that that's part of the proposals? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Again, just in reflecting on my earlier comments about the challenge, and it is 50 million, and it is across the health and social care trusts, um, which is, you know, um, about a percentage of about one percent or so in, in broad terms, um, and it will be split across, as I said earlier, um, the, the, the five or six health and social care trusts. So, um, in terms then of, of what those plans look like, um, I would say that those are going to. Um, the um, low impact savings measures is is the absolute intention, as has been the case certainly in 1920, um, by by bearing down on, on expenditure, um, by by looking at um, some of those opportunities that may exist by way of making some efficiency savings across the piece. Um, in terms of closing um, wards or closing care homes or et cetera, et cetera, well, those would come under the kind of umbrella of kind of high impact, and and those would be ones that would be um, you know, subject to, to consultation, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that the, the, the expectation is, in terms of the 50 million, that it would be in respect of the low impact measures, looking at cost containment and um, just efficiencies in, in general across the piece. Okay, so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pat? Thank you, Chair. Um, the current pandemic and uh, health emergency has brought into sharp relief the health inequalities in society. So, for example, uh, people in the most dis disadvantaged areas are more likely to suffer from COPD and diabetes, cardiovascular disease and so on. They're more likely to be sm smokers. And these have all been flagged up uh, as potential risks uh, in the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm just wondering, could you point us to uh, any specific areas in the budget aimed at addressing health inequalities in society. Thank you. Um, I don't have any of the specific details here that I could share with you today um, in terms of, of that particular aspect um, and looking at health inequalities. Um, you know, the, the approach we've taken to the financial planning and the figure work that you have for 2021 um, in terms of that is very much looking at um, what our forecast expenditure requirements are in a a global way, if I call it that, and looking at what our inescapable cost pressures are likely to be across a number of areas, um, and that's the level at which we do our financial planning um, estimations. Um, but I don't have um, specific details that I could share with you in respect of those particular areas that you mentioned um, by way of addressing those inequalities, um, but I'm happy if you're content that I can take that, that away and, and, and consider that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, Pat's indicating there that we would like to see more information. That's a key area, I think, that we need to, to see uh, how that's going to be protected. Um, Alan? Thanks, Chair. Uh, the Executive had uh, announced fairly challenging uh, plans to tackle waiting lists uh, in this uh, financial year. Uh, COVID has obviously, as you said earlier, has created huge uncertainty. Um, will there be a budget available to support uh, any attempts to reduce waiting lists if that aspiration should become possible in this financial year? Um, thank you. Um, so, yes, in terms of the elective care, you'll see from your pack we have identified um, an inescapable pressure of 30 million um, for 
to address the waiting times for red flag and urgent outpatient assessments and elective treatments. Um, and, you know, setting, in terms of broad context, setting transformation funding to the one side, you'll be aware that the forecast funding gap is around some 34 million or around half a percent of budget to put that into context. Um, and again, I would reiterate that that is based on estimated cost pressures at a point in time. Um, as I said, the position definitely does not stand still, and this is particularly the case as we head into 2021, given the need to respond to COVID. So it may be that there will be significant movements in cost requirements as a result of disruption to existing services, and um, we are continuing to review the inescapable pressures in liaison with Health and Social Care Board colleagues. Um, you know, that said, at this point in time, the proposed budget would allow the majority of the inescapable pressures set out in the template to be funded. And um, one area of particular uncertainty is the one you mentioned in relation to elective care waiting lists. Um, and again, given the need to respond to COVID-19, there's been some disruption to existing services, including elective care. What I would just say is that we will need to carefully review this position and this assessment. And again, reiterate that the department will work closely with the Health and Social Care Board to determine how best to take forward recovery. And that will include, of course, examining how elective care services can be taken forward and how the associated funding can be supported. Okay, thank you. Colin? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, during the presentation, there was huge amounts of figures being thrown about there, and it was very difficult to follow um, the, the different numbers that there were. But can I just, just for clarity, just to recap for the, uh, and to look at the process, um, is it a case that if you've got 661 million of pressures and there's 169 of that is the NDNA and that you're talking there about a figure of around about 470 million, does that mean that if in the budget you were to get the same amount of money as last year, that effectively you're about half a billion short and will have to find that money from cuts and that you won't be delivering on any of the NDNA except for the nurses pay? Okay, and just to um, go over some of those figures for you, yes, as, as you said, that 661 does include the 169 million for NDNA, and, and then it does, as the templates indicate, give a total pressure of 471 million um, of inescapable pressures going into 2021. Um, what that then in turn does is um, indicate to us that we have a funding shortfall of some 34 million. That is after we recognise savings of 72 million. That is after we take into the mainstream budget £37 million of transformation costs. Um, and we do recognise we have a funding shortfall of the 169. So um, th that is the, the position. So if we take the, the proposed budget settlement of the £399.6 million resource, that, and we work it through in the context of the £471 million of mainstream inescapable pressures, we are left with a funding gap or a shortfall of approximately 34 million. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I deal with um, says. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, uh, Neela, could you? There's, there's been obviously a considerable focus there in terms of in terms of savings. So, can you give us some idea of how those savings are actually assessed and analysed? and equality proofed and all of that. How, how do you go about uh, setting out to assess what savings might be achievable? Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of start off by sort of reiterating some of the points I mentioned earlier on by way of how we would do that in a strategic sense. First of all, we recognise ultimately that in, in a constrained um, financial um, setting, um, and in that backdrop, we have um, had it, found it necessary to set um, annual savings targets um, year on year. Um, and they're very much a, a assumed set of targets at the start of a financial year, such as where we are now, um, based on an assessment of the scale of um, the budgetary shortfall, ultimately. Um, it also takes account of, um, obviously, potential impact on services. Um, and that, that global sense of overall financial pressures faced across the system. We we are we do try to be realistic in in, in so far as that. Um, you know the fifty million pound figure, as I said, might seem a large figure, and and it is in terms of um, you know 
a quantum. However, when you break it down across the trusts in terms of the percentages, it, it boils down to um, a, a relatively small percentage. So just to put that in, into context for you. Um, there is no um, precise way of, of doing it, so to speak. It is, um, as I said, a risk-based assessment um, where we try and factor in all of the um, things that I've referred to there and coming up with it. Um, and, and it's one in which we have to be very close by way of our overall monitoring um, and to ensure that if um, the savings aren't being delivered or aren't on target to be delivered, that we look at um, alternative ways of, of delivering those. Um, and as I said in, in my opening comments, the situation for 1920 has been a prime example of that, where there have been um, significant reliance on slippage. And as a consequence of that, yes, the savings and cost reductions that have been delivered might not have been as originally envisaged, but they, they are being delivered um, in, in, in a total sense. So I guess, just to, to sort of um, summarise, I, I guess it's, it's based on judgement and taking into account pressures across the system and taking into account working closely with our health and social care board colleagues and, and their advice on that. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but I know, I know, I know and, and thank you for setting out the, the targets in terms of how you arrive at the targets, but in terms of critiquing where savings can be found, you know, the evidence, the oversight of those savings, the impact of those savings, how is that... How is that uh, managed? Again, so, so the um, fairness of them, or, or even even the impact they have on further inequality or in, in tackling inequality. How how do you critique potential savings? Well, when we we set the savings target in conjunction with the Health and Social Care Board um, and and monitor, monitor sorry um, regularly in terms of, of how it's been achieved. Um, in terms of the equality aspect, yeah, that would be something that is um, would be taken into account by way of the Health and Social Care Board um, and, and coming up and setting the targets for the trust in an individual way. As I said um, to an earlier question, the, the targets that we're referring to here for both 1920 and 2021 um, are what we would describe as the low impact cost savings measures. Um, they're not in the high impact category, um, and the expectation is that they would be done through um, more efficient ways of working, reduced, reducing cost bases. Um, you know, naturally, um, as is the case um, in, in any year, you would experience a situation where when you commence financial planning and you're looking at your assumptions, as often as the case, those are a set of assumptions that may, not, may or may not hold true as the year progresses. Things do change. Things change potentially significantly of any given year, um, and as a consequence of that, the um, intention and the um, expectation changes. So you would potentially end up um, with a situation where, for an example, there could be some slippage on a particular program, capital program, or, or, or otherwise, which then is you're in a different set of circumstances if you compare that against your opening assumptions that you had at the start of a particular year. Um, so at this point, I suppose it's just about reiterating the message that you know, it's an opening um, savings target. It's one we have to set given the overall funding gap that you can see, but it's by no means um, you know, constant or set categorically. It is very much one that is, um, will be reviewed closely and managed and will, in the context of COVID-19, amongst other things, will um, be done in that way. And, and how do you track then through the HSC, how do you track whether that has actually been, those savers have, have been delivered via low impact, low impact measures, or if it's, if it's more an issue of, say, failure to replace staff? How do you track and stand over and, and, and provide oversight on those decisions? Well, from a, purely from a financial perspective, um, one of the things we do in the department is monthly monitoring of the financial positions across all of our arm strength bodies. Um, in respect to the trust, we do that in close conjunction with the health and social care board finance colleagues. So we would see the deliverability of those. Um, we do work very closely with health and social care board finance colleagues on a very regular basis to get a, a firm understanding of the, the position. Um, and to keep that in, under close review and scrutiny, which will then, in turn, armed with that information, enables us then to determine, um, you know, uh, other alternative courses of action that may be necessary. 
Okay. Um, okay. The final final one from me then in in relation to. And I suppose we, we, we touched on the issue of McGee last week, and we have asked for additional uh, additional information in relation to McGee, the medical school at McGee, which we are concerned about. But we also have uh, the decision not to include IVF is concerning. So how will issues such as that and be decided upon if or when resource and capital becomes available again? How is that, how is that reviewed and uh, prioritised? Okay, I'll pick up on the IVF question. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, just to um, reiterate, it's, it's one of the NDNA priorities that we don't have any funding for in terms of um, getting that in our in proposed budget allocation. Um, so without that funding, um, we'll not be able to um, fund taking forward the NDNA priority. What I would say, though, um, again, back to the earlier comments around the fluidity of the position, um, we will still have to keep this one and um, reassessed in, in light of, of the overall budget uh, position. Um, but um, at this point, um, based on the figure work that we have, based on the, the, the forecast that we have that we've shared with you that you can see in terms of our gap, we would not have um, at this point the funding available um, um, to, to take that forward um, in terms of that. Um, but I'd say that purely with a, for my finance hat on. Um, it will be, be for policy colleagues to comment on the, um, you know, deliverability of that outside of the, the funding position. But I would just hold to the line that basically we'll have to reassess, um, as we have to do with all of our cost bases, reassess everything, um, and we will be doing that in coming weeks and months. Okay. Okay. Is the follow up on that, Jerry? It was a small separate. Point. Okay, we'll take one quickly, and then we're, we're drawn to a close. For me, yeah, thanks. Uh, just in, in regard to the reserve, how, how does access to the reserve happen? Um, if you'd explain that, please. Sir, could you maybe clarify your question for me? There was comments uh, in the papers about getting access to the reserve. Um, so I'm assuming there's reserved um, elements of, of cash. Um, so I, I want to understand the process in terms of how that happens. Is it applied for? Is it requested? And just to understand the process of getting access to the reserve. Um, if, I, if, I, if I may come in on that, um, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I suspect that may be a central matter that the Department of Finance would deal with, and that's probably why Neela and I are sort of Giving you a, a stunned silence there. Okay. Perfect. Yes, I would. I would concur with that, Bridget. Okay. Thank you. Um, listen. Thank you, Neela, Bridget, and Kira once again. And I suppose, uh, as we've we've already indicated, we're. Uh, we will be returning to budgetary issues on a, on a quite an ongoing basis to try to see how we improve the process, how we improve the the clarity of the process and, and the traceability of the decisions. But thank you for your return today and thank you for your, your answers to our questions and uh, just wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks very much. Bye. bye. So members, we will now take another short break to return back to room 29. Yeah, isn't that? And we'll resume our meeting in room 29 in about five minutes again. Thank you. Musical. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Assumed. So we're moving on to uh, SR 2020 forward slash 71, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Regulations 2020. And can I refer members to the papers at tab 7 of your pack? Can I advise members that the Department has made a statutory rule to amend the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations to remove the restrictions on the opening of cemeteries to the public and to clarify the circumstances under which a person may leave home for the purposes of taking exercise. The SR was made under the Emergency Procedure of the Public Health Act 1967 and came into operation on 24th of April. The Department has advised that due to the urgency of the situation addressed by the SR, there was no time to bring an SL1 to the committee. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this SR, and the SR is subject to the draft affirmative procedure. I can advise members that Mr. Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Health Officer in the Department of Health, is available to answer questions if required. So, have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Yeah, Jerry, go ahead. 
Just, just generally, Chair, um, there was a concern raised to me about cemetery workers in, in regards to the cemetery um, sort of policy um, in relation to that. So I don't know if there's, if there's any protection or, or security um, towards them in, in the new arrangements. I don't know if Nigel can answer that, but I just wanted to, to put that, the flag that question. Nigel, did you hear that? Okay. In that sense, it's for those responsible for the individual cemetery or burial grounds to decide if they're able to do so safely, both in terms of protecting their own staff that may be on site um, and any visitors. So to that extent, some may choose not to open uh, in order to feel that they can meet the workplace requirements on safety, whereas others may feel that um, the risk is manageable, the risk is low, and then they will go ahead and, and open. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to, we have had some issues around the, uh, the provision of, of people for exercising for the purpose of people who have autism or, or young people with autism. Um, does this rule, the, there's, some, there's some reference within the rule to a reasonable, re, reasonable uh, I'm not sure the actual wording, but does it take into account or are the department making further adjustments in relation to the autism issue? We have a lot of feedback there, Nigel. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm Orlea, I'm sorry, just, just give me a second. second. Orlea, can you mute, mute your phone there? A second? Uh, yes, my phone's on mute, Colin. Okay, we're still getting a lot of feedback, Nigel. There's nothing. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to attempt to answer if you can hear me. We can hear you, but we can hear someone else as well. Right, okay, and I, and I can hear myself feeding back as well. Okay. Okay, well, uh, yeah, so. Can I go ahead and do that? Yeah, go ahead and do that, Nigel, please. Yeah. Okay, okay. In relation to the amendment to the regulations, um, the relevant aspect, I suppose, in terms of anybody with uh, a health condition, including autism, is that the amendment um, clarifies that um, travel for exercise is a, is a reasonable excuse. So in case there was any previous doubt, the uh, amendment that the Attorney General asked for was just to clarify that point, that travel from home uh, by car or whatever form for the purposes of finding a suitable place to exercise um, is, uh, uh, is a reasonable excuse, is allowable. Um, the regulation doesn't say anything specific in terms of people with disability uh, uh, or autism. That, that uh, is covered in more detail in guidance. Um, the uh, Cabinet Office guidance uh, on this, which was updated on the 8th of April, um, was clarified to cover this particular point. Um, and if I, if I can just quote from that, the, the amended guidance says, <clears throat> excuse me, you can leave your home for medical need if you or a person in your care have a specific health condition that requires you to leave the home to maintain your health, including if that involves travel beyond your local area, then you can do so. This could, for example, include where individuals with learning disabilities or autism require specific exercise in an open space two or three times each day, ideally in line with a care plan agreed with a medical professional. Even in such cases, in order to reduce the spread of infection and protect those exercising, travel outside of the home should be limited as close to your local area as possible, and you should remain at least two metres apart from anyone who is not a member of your household uh, or carer at the time. Now, we are aware of some, some confusion um, about the applicability of this guidance, um, and we would confirm that it is uh, applicable UK-wide. The police are aware of it, and PS and I are using it, and, and clarified in a media interview uh, that they were applying it in terms of their reasonableness. 
um, test. However, there has been an issue raised about the reference in, in that guidance to um, having a care plan in place, and we're very aware of uh, representations from some groups that some children and young people with complex needs may, may not necessarily have a care plan in place. So work has been going on um, with the Health and Social Care Board and PHA to draft something up that clarifies that point in the respective Northern Ireland, and we will be sharing that with, um, with PSNI, and we're hoping to, to have that signed off um, imminently. I would also just say on that point that um, Health and Social Care Board and Public Health Agency have been working on the draft template letter that um, families can request uh, from their local health and social care trust, just to sort of give that, that comfort that they, they, they have a, a member of their family uh, who requires to travel possibly more than once a day for the purpose of exercise, and that, that is something that they could um, refer to or, or, or show if they were, were challenged. Um, that's uh, not quite signed off yet, but we're hopefully hoping that will be available shortly. And finally, just to say that I've been made aware that the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust um, have also produced and are issuing um, lanyards to people on request. I'm not quite sure what form they actually take. Um, but uh, as far as I'm aware, there are no plans to introduce something similar in the other trust areas at the moment. Um, so that's all I can say on that point. Chair, I hope you were able to hear that okay. It's a bit disconcerting hearing myself feedback. Slightly delayed to myself, but hopefully you could hear that okay. Yes, I think we heard it okay. I think I think we did hear it. I have a question from Pam Cameron now, Nigel. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you for what I could hear of that. Maybe if you could send through the that the wording of that guidance, that would be useful. Obviously I've haven't received a response from the Ministry yet after raising that issue around the autism piece. I suppose um, even if the guidance is allowing people with disabilities or autism to go out and exercise as, as anybody is entitled to go out to exercise, uh, that might not quite address it, but given that it's, it's, it might be more of an issue of how many times a day you go out in your car with uh, someone with a, a disability or autism. And also, a lot of these cases is actually not to exercise, it is simply uh, like a, a calming mechanism, you know, taking someone uh, out with a disability or with autism out in the car for, for drives. And I'm, I'm aware of uh, individuals who are being driven around for very long periods of time in the day because it's the only way to stop them from um, coming to harm and harming themselves. So I, I think we would still probably need some more clarity around that issue um, so that people don't feel that if they're stopped by PSNI that they are um, going to be um, subjected to some kind of a fine for, for basically trying to cope with the um, medical conditions of, of their loved ones. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I, I would say that uh, PSNI are aware of the situation and in applying the reasonable test, obviously the individual circumstances at the time come into play, but I'd be reasonably confident that uh, certainly in the vast majority of cases it wouldn't be uh, an issue. But to back that up, um, we, we are talking about this uh, draft letter that people could have a copy of if they, if they need it. Um, I will feed back to Learning and Disability Unit uh, your, your point about it not necessarily being purely for um, exercise and see if we can do something something on that. Um, the, the existing Cabinet Office guidance as amended, which we're working to at the moment, does um, acknowledge that leaving the home multiple times in the day be appropriate for somebody with a, a, a condition that, that might require that. appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Nigel before we let him go? Okay. Yep, okay. Orlea, any questions for Nigel there, if you're still with us? No, thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, thank you, Nigel, for, for those uh, answers. Thank you for that. We can let you go. Thank you, Chair. I'm All right, thank you. Bye. Okay, members, so um, have members anything they, they wish to raise before we... I just wanted to, to come back on that point about the lanyards. Uh, my understanding was that 
they, they announced them, but they only had 500 in stock in the Belfast Trust. So apparently there was there were major issues then with a lot of people and a lot of social workers, for example, frantically trying to find them. So I think it's it's to be welcomed, but I would say that they need to really ramp that up to make sure that they actually get the, the numbers are required, and likewise across different trust areas. Okay, Alan. Yeah, the. Um I'm just wondering about uh, the effect of an autistic child uh, in a car being stopped by the police uh, and the police applying the, the reasonable test and saying, carry on with your journey. Um, but I'm just wondering, uh, does that have or can that have a detrimental effect on, on the autistic child in the car? You know, the fact that the police have stopped them and are looking in and talking through the window. And we've talked about the lanyards, and I think it's a good idea, but. Um, I'm wondering if there wouldn't be some sort of a, a system, and we don't know how long this is going to last, I mean, only for three or four weeks, you, you wouldn't want to be going down uh, sort of a, a, this sort of road, but I'm wondering if, if, if windscreen stickers might be more appropriate, a small windscreen a screen, uh, certificate or something that would indicate sort of the police are you know, checking the traffic, they would know that there was a child in that car that was... Uh, had a disability or, or, or suffered from autism and, and wouldn't actually then stop them to put them through a form of interrogation about their journey. Okay, Pam. Yeah, um, I'm sure that's a good idea worth following up, but just to make uh, a, a small point that it's not even necessarily autistic children, you know, it's mm. adults. Um, um, and. And it's about, it's not even just about a coping me mechanism, it's about actually keeping those individuals safe and, and keep them from harming um, themselves and others. Sometimes um, so there can be quite a bit of violence involved. So just, I think it's, it's been a very long time for people and families who are dealing with um, severe disabilities and, and autism. Um, and I think it's time is of the essence that they, they, they clear this up pretty quickly because well, there's nothing to say even if restrictions are, are lightened soon that, that we won't have to go backwards again into into uh, the restrictions and into lockdown. So I think it's uh, it is a, a matter that um, requires some urgency from the department to deal with. Yeah, and, and in conjunction in conjunction with the police, maybe around the sensitivities of, of all of that and being being autism aware, I suppose, just essentially. I don't I don't know if it impacts the SR directly, and I don't know if it's if it, I think it's something maybe members should raise maybe themselves yes. through their own channels around because there could be unforeseen consequences to some of those. While they're while they're useful steps, I think we should a, a member should pursue that maybe them, them, themselves. Um, so. Are we happy to go back to the actual SR itself? Any other issues? So, have, uh, if can I ask members then to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 71, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules reports, recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Members Agreed. content? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Agreed earlier. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, members. Moving on then to correspondence, can I refer members to correspondence at tab 8 of your pack and also the correspondence memo at tab 8.1. Are members content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Um, so I'm not sure, well, there are two items, just go into some more detail, there are two items of correspondence in table papers, item 8.19 is a reply from the Pharmaceutical Society regarding our query about rapid registration of pharmacists in the North if they are already registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council in Britain or the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland. I am pleased to say that emergency arrangements have now been put in place to facilitate this during this pandemic. Um, are members content to forward this to the individual who wrote to the committee on this matter? Yep, members content. Item 8.20 is a copy of a letter from the Minister of Health to the Education Committee advising of childcare arrangements for key workers during the pandemic. Are members content to note that item? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, emailed separately to members yesterday was the legal advice we requested on the Assembly's options in terms of legislating in the field of abortion further to the regulations brought in via Westminster. Are members content to note pending a further sc future scrutiny session on this matter? Content. Content. Mm, content. 
forward work programme then. Item 9, and I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 9.1 of the pack. Um, there, is, there is an issue, I think, kind of bouncing around all of, all of the work we're doing at the minute in terms of policies and, and lessons learned and kind of, I suppose, competing views on how, on how you deal with, with the pandemic. But I know there, there are significant organisations out there who are taking an interest in this and are looking at it and who can provide expertise. And I think it would be useful for us to hear from some of those experts if we could set up a panel discussion with them. In terms of timing, I think time is in some senses of the essence. I think there's there's a, a sense of a sense of you know that we're in a space now where we can pick up on the lessons that have been learned. We could, quicker than any of us realise, move into a second surge. So what what I'm what I have been thinking, uh, and it's only sort of over the past wee while, even even this morning, I was thinking over again. Could we arrange an additional session, maybe next Thursday afternoon, to, to facilitate that so we're not cutting into time, we're not knocking some of the other very important briefings which are coming up down the line? Would it be possible for us to do that, Ellis, to facilitate an additional meeting um, or, or an extended meeting? I can explore that. Uh, I think the only issue potentially is that Thursday afternoons, if the COVID-19 ad hoc committee meets, there can be issues about simultaneous broadcasting of more than one event, and indeed members may wish to attend the other one. The other issue uh, is obviously the timeline and getting experts to make to be available. Uh, a week wouldn't be very much notice, and to be, you wouldn't be necessarily getting confirmed um, attendance quite that quickly. But uh, possibly the week after might be more realistic. Yeah, Jerry. Just generally, sure. I mean, I, I think that the proposal is, is good and worthwhile. I mean, even some of the questions that I myself asked today, it was kind of that was a policy matter, and you know, to me, it was insufficient answers. Now, I might be. Then that, not the correct staff members, and then having a go at that person. But you know, I think, as you said yourself, there's a possibility of a second wave. Germany sort of exited the lockdown. There's now concerns about, you know, was that too quickly? So I think time is of the essence, and as quickly as possible. I think extra sessions uh, in regards to hearing from experts and hearing what measures were and were took them uh, would be very, very useful. Any other views? Um. Well, I suppose two weeks. If, in terms of if, in terms of setting it up, if two weeks means we get a richer a richer panel, um, can can we look at doing it then the the week of the fourteenth? Is that correct? Um, we can certainly look into that. Yeah. Um, are members content that we we go with that that and because uh, I know we have the minister and and the chief medical officer next week, so I don't want to cut out. I want to ensure that we get time for a for a, a realistic session with with those. Okay, well, so we're, we're, we're agreed that we'll look at a, at a session from... Chair, is there not some... I think I've read this week some guidance coming through um, about committee meetings being switched to Wednesdays, plus the availability of rooms or something. They were trying to condense everything in there. That had been a proposal, Alan, and they had, they had decided to protect the health committee in terms of the volume of work we're doing. They said they would leave us on a Thursday, so we still have that. Yeah, that's fine. We still have that slot. Okay. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll schedule that then for, uh, we'll explore that for, for the 14th. Okay. Moving on then to any other business. Colin, you have? Uh, yeah, just quickly, I was following on actually from something that Paula had said. I think maybe as we're moving into this new dispensation of, of getting reports and updates by, by um, phone, and, and mem sometimes people would have come in and even had slides or other bits and pieces or handouts or something. Is there any way that we could, if people have their speaking notes, because a lot of times the people are coming on and they're reading, you literally know that they're reading from a bit of paper, that if there was a way that maybe an hour before the meeting they forwarded it to early or to somebody that it could be circulated around, because sometimes you can underline or you miss something that somebody says, and rather than saying, could you go through that again, or, you know, you just don't have that same interaction if you have somebody face to face, but, I mean, if I take that response, and it wasn't the lady's fault but the response that I got back there was that many numbers kicking about and I had no clue what she was saying you know because it was like five six million here three million from there two million up to that leaves you at that and you take it away from here and there you are you know if you had something in front of you that you actually had it written down and I say there's very few people that will present to a committee that don't have a typed speaking note and it's not about giving it just a week before just if we had it even 10 minutes before on the screen so that we could underline as they're actually speaking it might help us to to come back, but especially for things like budgets, it, it's it's really important if if that's possible. Yeah. Okay, Pat. 
Uh, and that would be valuable, Chair, because uh, for those particularly phoning in, it's it's bad enough here sitting uh, listening to that speaker, but when you're on the phone, and it has happened two days in a row now with me uh, phoning in earlier this morning and yesterday to the TEO committee, the line kept dropping in and out, so you were actually literally missing parts of things that were being said. So it would be valuable if someone's making a presentation that it's provided uh, beforehand. Uh, and then we are in a position to be able to interrogate it properly. Well, I suppose, yeah, I suppose the department, the budget officials had had provided paper the, the week before, and I did ask them then if they wanted to make additional comments. I suppose, but yes, I agree, it would be it would be helpful. I think the BSO one as well clearly could have been with us in advance. We could have had that our heads around that and maybe truncated that part of it and moved on to getting into the question and answer. So I think that's I think that's certainly valid. Um, so I think in general we'd be looking if people are doing a presentation, we'd be looking not to have that in, in advance. Um, uh, the budget papers were back in this week's pack as well. Sure. Yeah, but sure, it's not the papers, the, the, there's dozens of pages, but then if they're going to do a presentation on the papers, then we have a presentation on a presentation. So it's either give us the presentation or make your presentation, but to do a presentation on a presentation means that you're then dealing with two levels of notes, what's in front of you and what you're listening to. So it's getting that together rather than just what's on what they've already given us. Paula. I'm just uh, I'm grateful we do get the committee papers through then mm. in a couple of weeks' time of the full narrative, but I'm just wondering, did we request his speaking notes, the gentleman today from BSO, that he will send those through now after the meeting? Because I would like to see that, because again, I think my questioning wasn't as effective because I didn't have it in front of me. So I would like to actually see it in print form now. I think we can yeah, ask for that, certainly. We can look about that. And Ellen, yes. Another issue, yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, before I move off this yeah. issue, Elish, can you, can you, when when we're engaging with people, if they're doing a presentation, can you ask if they're doing, as Colin says, a summary of, of what's being provided, if that can be provided to us for for members just to note. We can ask for that, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Alan, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, we've probably all been receiving uh, correspondence from a gentleman whose uh, mother had passed away under the care of, of Dr. Watt. And I think I recollect that the the it wasn't that that particular sector wasn't included maybe in the original terms or reference of the inquiry, but um, I thought that the chair of the inquiry w was due to come along to give us a presentation. Obviously, um, things have been stood in its head with uh, COVID, but I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, you, you know what that. I don't really have anything to go back to this gentleman to say. I just wondered if I could have an update. On, on where we actually are, with uh, where that inquiry is, is that inquiry being suspended during the, 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 the this uh, crisis? Um, and if the, the chair is going to come to us, and if that sector is going to be included in, in the inquiry? Yeah, and um, I suppose events, in a way, overtook the overtook the briefing. I suppose is is part of the issue. Um, is there something that well, um, just to say that obviously um, further to the guidance and agreed by this committee, um, it was a guidance issued by the Chair's Liaison Group asking all committees to focus on COVID-19 only. Um, and in light of that, as agreed by this committee, we cancelled all non-COVID related business for the next couple of months. So along with that, um, that briefing fell. At that point, as the um, inquiry, can you give us any update as the inquiry, the work of the inquiry is still ongoing or, or is it on hold as well? And, and I'm not in a position to advise uh, at this point about that. Could we find that out? Could, could we ask them for, if they give us just a written update on, on you know, on, on whether or not they, they are being impacted by COVID and how they're planning to... Because this gentleman, I think, has the impression that everybody's sort of... Uh, uh, blocking them and, and, and not been transparent with them and I think it is important that we, you know, I, I feel it's important that I've got to be able to say something to them. We, we also need to remain cognizant that it's an independent inquiry as well, yeah. so we need to be, you know, we need to be ensure that we don't do anything that would, that yeah. would challenge that, but maybe, maybe a written update in terms of what the impact has been or, or if it's okay, are we agreed on that? Okay, members, that takes us to date, time and place of next meeting. So the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 7th of May, 2020. Room to be confirmed. Hopefully, we'll be able to <laughs> have one. Work a, bit, a bit smoother with the technology. So thank you all very much, members, and good luck. And please stay safe in the, in the time ahead. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.